Presenting Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. CX-4 calling control tower. CX-4 calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower back to CX-4. Wind southeast. Ceiling 1200. All clear. Okay. This is Hop Harrigan. Coming in. America's ace of the airways, coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. <laughs> Say, gang, lately I've been doing a lot of talking about our air forces and their up-to-date developments for our aviation of the future. While all this research and building is going on, many of our commercial airlines are busy, too. Besides joining in the hunt for new and better planes... The airlines have been doing a lot of work expanding their service to the American shipper and traveler. You know, there's no faster way of getting any place than by air. But regularly scheduled lines just can't take off or land anywhere they want. They've got to have set routes and timetables all made up in advance. Just a little while ago, United Airlines made a new and important improvement in its service. United Airlines mainliners now shuttle between Denver and Los Angeles and make regular stops at in-between cities like Grand Junction, Colorado, and Las Vegas, Nevada. If you're up in your geography, you know that Denver is the gateway to the great and beautiful West. Stretching past the mile-high city are the states of Utah, Nevada, and California. Those are great tourist areas, as well as business states. That's why United Airlines' new route from Denver is so important. On a short vacation, a flying trip to the West may save precious days. And on rush business matters, there's nothing like an airplane speed. It all adds up to improved traveling conditions for American passengers and faster handling of cargo. In just a few minutes, I'll be back with more interesting information on United Airlines' new route and a new step forward in aviation. So don't forget to listen. And now to our story. The theft of Dixie Davenport's wonder horse, Sequoia and the startling reappearance of Joe Bell, her pilot, the following morning, has thrown the motion picture location camp into an uproar. To keep Dixie occupied, Ivan Ivanov, the director, suggested work, and the boys left for the set at once. But Dixie, pleading for a few minutes to fix her makeup, stayed behind. When finally Mr. Ivanov sent his assistant to call her, he came running back, shouting that she was gone. Now the camp is almost completely disorganized. Ivan Ivanov, roaring his displeasure, has locked the door to his quarters. Hop and Tank, puzzled and more than a little worried, hurry over to Dixie's dressing room. For Pete's sake, what got into her? Why'd she go running off? That's what we're going to find out. She was awful upset about Sequoia. Maybe she blew her top. Oh, no, Tank. Dixie's a pretty level-headed girl. She was all right when we left her. Yeah, but you know dames. They nearly always fall in the clutch. I know. That's a pretty broad statement, pal. Better not let Gail ever hear you say that. Oh, Gail's different. Uh, here's the dressing room. Come on. I'm going in. What do you expect to find here, anyway? If she's gone, she's gone. Take a look. Huh? Joe's still here. Mm. Looks like he's asleep. Does he? Close it, though. What's the idea? Go on, close it. Okay. What? Oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Hart. Yes, Joe. Sorry we woke you. Oh, that's okay. I've been lying here trying to get rid of my headache. Oh, of course. It, you were slugged. Uh-huh. That guy really let me have it. Does it hurt much, pal? Pretty bad, Mr. Tinker. You should have been more careful. What'd you say? Skip it. Tell me, Joe, where's Miss Davenport? How did I know? Ain't she with you? No. She was here a couple of minutes ago putting on some makeup. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah, she was going out to shoot another scene. She didn't show up. What? Come off it, Joe. You're not a very good actor. What do you mean? It's quite a trick to be able to fall asleep and then remember how much time has passed. I know I could never do it. What are you driving at? How do you know Miss Davenport was here only a few minutes ago if you were really sleeping? Well, I I thought that... What did you tell her that made her leave camp? I didn't tell her anything. Did you by any chance give her the instructions she was waiting for? What instructions... I don't know what you're talking about. Hop, are you sure you're figuring right? I'm positive. Now, listen, Joe, you made a terrific entrance this morning, falling unconscious off a horse and then telling a beautiful story, but I didn't swallow it. 
And I won't swallow this latest routine either. Why do you get off talking to me like that? I ought to punch you right in the nose. Sit down, you. I will not. I'm getting out of here. A very rapid recovery. Sit down, Bob, or I'll knock you down. You can't get away with this. Who's going to stop me? Joe, sit down. No, I won't. Pop said sit down. Uh... All right, all right. You don't have to get tough about it. Now, let's get down to facts. Start from the beginning, Joe. What really happened last night? I told you. I want to hear it again. A man wearing a black scarf over his face surprised you while you were stretched out on your bunk in the plane. That's right. He told you to start the engines. Yeah. How much flying time do you have, Joe? Over a thousand hours. And do you mean to say you couldn't have faked trouble? He, he had a gun. I was scared. I see. Then Miss Davenport arrived with Sequoia. You met her at the ramp and took the horse inside. Yeah, that's what I said. He was holding a gun on me all the time. I couldn't do anything else. Where was he standing? Well, he, he was up in the flight compartment. And you were at the ramp. That's a pretty tough shot, Joe. He would have had to lean out the cockpit window to get you, which would give you plenty of time to duck under the ship. I was afraid Miss Davenport might get hurt. She could have gotten under there, too. But I didn't think, that's all. Or else your thinking was done for you. Then you said he forced you to take off. You flew the ship according to his instructions, but you didn't know where you were going. I told you, he kept the compass covered. The magnetic compass? Yeah. How did he cover it? What, why, with his hand. How many hands did he have, Joe? I don't get you. In case you've forgotten, there are at least two other compasses on the panel. Why? Maybe he grew a couple of extra hands to keep them covered, too. You're, you're trying to trick me. Uh-uh, you've tricked yourself. Now, come on out with it. Where did you take Sequoia? I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. You know all right. I got mixed up. We, we, we turned so many times. You'll find compasses can always keep track of those things. Well, we, we were heading west into the mountains the last I remember. How far away from the camp were you when you landed? I don't know. you got to believe me. Like fun, we will. Now, Joe, we'll get down to what happened only a few minutes ago. What did you tell Miss Davenport? I, uh... If you say you didn't tell her nothing, I'll shove this fist right down your throat. Well? I gave her a message. What message? To go to the Timberline Hotel in Barstow. And? That's all. Just go there, register, and wait. Why didn't you tell us before? I was only supposed to tell Miss Davenport. He, he told me if somebody else found out, he'd kill me. And that brings up the last point. Who is... He. I don't know. Listen, Bob, I'm getting tired of hearing Plus, that. I don't know. His face was hit all the time. I never saw him once. Huh. You want me to pound it out of him? No, no, leave him alone. That's all you have to tell us, Joe? Yeah, but honest, I didn't have anything to do with it. I, I had to do what he told me. I have my doubts, but we can't waste any more time here. Tank. Yeah. Take him over to Ivanov. Tell Ivanov to hang on to him until he hears from us. What are we going to do? Fly to Barstow and see Dixie. I'll get the beach ready. Go on now, roll. Come on, punk, move. And okay, fast, or I'll okay. give you that call, my punk. Come on, never mind. Turn it around. Just move. Catch her, Hop. Well, near as I can figure it, she has about a half hour lead on us, but Barstow's only 60 miles away. With luck, we should get there about the same time she does. Hey, suppose that little punk Joe pulled a fast one. Maybe he's sending us on a wild goose chase. Oh, no, I don't think he'd try anything now. He's caught and he knows it. Say, what did Ivanov say when you took him in? Yeah, we blew his top. Started yanking his beard and yelling at the top of his lungs. <laughs> Honest, that guy's nuts. Oh, well, he's very concerned about Dixie. Well, listen, have you figured out what we're going to do after we see Dixie, I mean? No, but she shouldn't try to handle this thing alone. Yeah, she's only a girl. Hop. Yeah. You think Tex will come across? Come across? Give Dixie back her horse. Frankly, No. Oh, Hop. Sorry, but that's the way it adds up to me, pal. Tex has a tiger by the tail now, and he can't let go. I'm afraid if we don't find Sequoia before Tex makes a deal with Dixie, we'll never see that horse again. Pop makes a grim prophecy, but a logical one, and so opens the throttle wider, sending the beach craft roaring through the late morning sky. They must find Dixie before Tex Regan contacts her. There's a startling climax to today's episode, gang, so stand by. Just a few minutes ago, gang, I was telling you all about United Airlines' brand new regularly scheduled flights from Denver to the Pacific Coast. And you can take it from me, it was a pretty exciting day for the airline when the first plane took off. 
There were about 200 people gathered around one of United's giant mainliners on a Denver airport that morning. Then up stepped a pretty moving picture starlet, raised a bottle, and smashed it over the nose of the great four-engine ship. After that, a group of governors, mayors, and businessmen boarded the plane for the first flight along the new route. It was a thrilling moment for the line officials when the DC-6 took off smooth as a bird and headed west for Los Angeles. Just three and one-half hours later, the plane came down in the Pacific Coast City with the same ease as the takeoff. That same day on the return trip, the ship landed in Las Vegas. And at the Las Vegas airport, another crowd gathered around while the movie starlet branded the plane. <laughs> Sir, the mainliner got branded just like a cowboy brands a steer. And that, fellas and girls, is what happened on the first trip over the new route. This is only a small example of what American airline companies are doing to make their service better. Whether it's a new route or new and faster ship or a new gadget that makes plane travel safer or more comfortable, the airlines are on the job. And that's the tip-off on how our entire aviation industry operates, always with an eye to improvement for the future. Keep this in mind, gang. Aviation looks to the future. And if you want to join the increasing ranks of the pilots and technicians of tomorrow, get ready now. It's none too early, regardless of your age. And always remember, America needs flyers. And now, back to our story. Arriving in the small desert town of Barstow in record time... Pop and Tank went immediately to the Timberline Hotel and, checking the register, found that Dixie had arrived only a few minutes before. Without announcing themselves, they went up to her room, but her greeting was most unexpected. What are you two doing here? What? <laughs> Dixie, we've come to help. Yeah. Well, thanks, but I don't need any help. Oh, now, Dixie, you can't handle this. It's too dangerous. Yes, I can, and I will. Now, please, Hop, go back to camp and leave me alone. <laughs> Sorry, nothing doing. Hop, you'll ruin everything if you don't go. I'm sorry, Dixie, but you can't deal with Regan. Oh, he, he'll double cross this you. This is the only way. Now, will you go? No. All right. I'm sorry, but you asked me. Help! Well, help! Don't be Jenny. Dixie! Dixie, stop it! Help me! Stop it, Dixie! Put it out for Pete's sake! Dixie! Hurry up, they'll get away! Are you out of your mind? Help! Dixie! Here, here, what's going on? Get them! Call the police! I'm the house detective, ma'am. What's the matter? They were trying to break into my room. What? She's them. crazy. We didn't do no such thing. Oh, yeah? Officer, it's all a mistake. Don't you listen to them, officer. Here, look. That one tried to pull this ring off my well, finger. It's worth thousands of dollars. I did it. ain't true. All right, you two. Now, come on. No, no, no. Just a minute. Get your hands off of me. No rough stuff, big boy. This gun will cool you off fast. Oh, oh, yeah? Officer, will you please let us explain? There's nothing to explain, officer. I caught them in the act. Dixie, come on, come on. We're going down to the state. Oh, but you must listen to You'll us. have to come down and press charges, ma'am. Oh, I will. I'll be there in a few minutes. Well, okay, let's go. Now, move. I know. Let's go. You can't do it. Protesting furiously, but in vain, Pop and Tank are forced down the hotel corridor at gunpoint as Dixie turns and closes the door to her room. Gang, you won't want to miss the next episode in Hops and Tank's new adventure, so be sure to listen. Tune in and fly with Pop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Pop Harrigan is a transcribed, copyrighted feature appearing in All American Comics magazine and is brought to you Monday through Friday, same time, same mutual station. Presenting Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airways. CX-4 calling control tower. CX-4 calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower back to CX-4. 
shore, wind southeast, sailing 1,200, all clear. Okay, this is Hop Harrigan, coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. Fellas and girls, a few hours ago, a United Airlines mainliner landed at LaGuardia Field. On hand to greet this giant of the sky were reporters, photographers, and aviation officials. The reason for all the excitement was young Kenneth Bonham of Chicago, Illinois. Ken was the first prize winner of the big name Hop Harrigan's plane contest. And here he is with us now to tell us how it feels to be a winner of a contest. Well, how does it feel, Ken? Mr. Riggs, this is the happiest day of my life. Oh, I can believe that. Is it true, Ken, that the flight in from Chicago was your first airplane ride? That's right, Mr. Riggs. I've never been inside a plane before today. I've never even seen an airfield. Well, then this is really quite a day for you. How old are you, Ken? I'm 11 years old. Well, I know you haven't been in New York long enough to tell us what you think of the big city, but you've got a lot of things to do today and a lot of things to see. Did you have fun at LaGuardia Field? I sure did. After I landed at the field, my mother and I toured the United Airlines hangars. Then we had lunch at the airport. Mm-hmm. Well, that's only the beginning of your day. When you leave the studio, you and your mother will be taken to the Hotel Lexington. You'll have dinner in the famous Hawaiian room. And following dinner, you're going on a tour of the radio stations. Later on this evening, you're going to see a fine show. And tomorrow, I hear they've got your mother on a radio quiz show. Well, I know you'll be rooting for her. After the quiz show, you'll get a chance to see the major points of interest in New York. Oh, I could go on and on like this, but I see it's time now to join Hop Harrigan. Don't go away, Ken. I want to talk with you later. Gang, don't forget to listen. And now to our story. One surprising event has followed closely on the heels of another. And now, on the second day of their new venture, acting in a Western movie, Hop and Tank find themselves in jail. As the young pilot stares moodily out of the barred window of their cell, Tank stomps back and forth on the stone floor, six paces forward, six paces back, in endless round trips, grumbling incessantly. It's just like a game. You can always count on to do something wrong. Try your best to help me end up getting it in the next... Tank, how long are you going to keep that up? Well, I'm sore. I don't feel any too good myself, but you're not helping matters running a rat race around the cell. Well, i got to blow off steam somehow. We beat our brains out trying to help Dixie, and look where we wind up, in the can. How long are we going to be stuck here, anyway? As long as it takes Ivan Ivanov to get here. He'll see that we're released, all right. Yeah, you hope. That screwball is just as liable to fix us so we get hot. Now, don't be ridiculous, Tank. How do you know he's coming? I called the location camp when we were brought in. Told Peabody the whole story. Oh, Hop, what's it all about, anyhow? Why did Dixie say we was trying to break into her room and steal her jewels? Because she wanted to get us out of the way. But we wanted to help her. She's trying to play it alone. Yeah, but it won't work. You said so yourself. Tex Regan will double-cross her. I know it. I only hope she and Regan haven't made contact yet. Regan, show me that day out. Ah, please. Ivanov, sign this money. It's Ivanov, at last. Down this way. Oh, brother, now we can get out. Here's the cell you want. Oh, oh gosh, we're glad to see you, Mr. Ivanov. We thought you'd never get here. Okay, go on in. You've only got five minutes. It will be in now. Five minutes? Aren't you going to get us out of here? Yes, you are. Mr. Harrigan, people are not put in the Bastille for nothing. I've come to find out how bad is your crime. Crime? We ain't done nothing. That is what they always say in the movies. This is not a movie, Mr. Tinker. So tell me what you did. If it's not too bad, perhaps one of influence will make the sentence lighter. Sentence? He's railroading. Call the tank. Look, Mr. Ivanov, this has all been a bad mistake. I know, Mr. Harrigan, I know. So tell me what you did do. Nothing. We was framed. Mr. Tinker, do not raise your voice. It gives me a headache. Oh, no. Let me explain, Mr. Ivanov. That is what I'm waiting for, Mr. Harrigan. Begin at the beginning, and when you come to the end, stop. Yeah, be sure and stop. Mr. Ivanov, you know what happened this morning? Of all the ridiculous questions, all the wasted time, the wasted money, how could I forget? Well, we found out Dixie came here to Barstow. She was trying to make a deal with the man who stole her horse. Make a deal? Explain yourself. Well, she was told that if she registered at the Timberline Hotel, the man who stole the horse would meet her, tell her how she could get him back. So? That's why we came here. We wanted to help Dixie. We were afraid Regan would double-cross her. So? So what happened? She wouldn't let us help her. She sicked the cops on us. She what? She began screaming at the top of her lungs. When the hotel detective showed up, she accused us of trying to steal her jewels. So we were hauled off to jail. We didn't have a chance. (laughs) What's so funny? (laughs) Ah, my darling Dixie. She is so clever. Such a wonderful idea. 
I use it in my next production. Go ahead and use it, but get us out of here first. Tell me, for why did she do this? Apparently she's afraid that if Regan sees us or knows we're around, he won't deal with her. Yeah, if we ain't around, he'll really give her the business. Uh Uh-huh. So, very bad situation. What are you going to do about it? I will have you released right here. If we could go any place. Officer! Officer! Come on, let me out of here. Okay. I will speak to the desk sergeant's personnel and explain everything. You will be in here no longer than it takes you one of us to say a few words. That ain't short. Okay, come on. Well, thank you. Do not worry, Miss Anna, again. I will be back. Yeah, he'll be back all right. Sergeant will give him the next cell. But true to his word, Ivanov returns within the space of a few minutes and triumphantly announces their release. Wasting no time, they all jump into the director's limousine and head for the Timberline Hotel again. It's two o'clock, almost three hours since we saw Dixie. I hope we're not too late. Too late for what? Well, if she and Regan have met already, Lord knows what will happen. Will you please be so kindly to stop playing dirty questions with me, Mr. Harrigan? That is just what I ask. What will happen? For Pete's sake, don't you get it yet? Dixie will most likely pay Regan off, and then he'll be holding all the aces. Aces? They're playing cards at a time like this? Uh, no, no, of course not, sir. But I'm sure he won't give Sequoia back to her. He'll take her money and then simply disappear. No, he cannot do this. Why not? No matter where he takes the horse, people would know the horse Sequoia. That's just it. He'd kill it. Kill it? Over my dead body? Here's the hotel. Do your best with her, Mr. Ivan. I'll try to persuade her that she's got to let us help her, that she won't get anywhere dealing with Regan alone. You can count one, two, three on me, Mr. Harrigan. When Ivanov makes up his mind, his mind is made up. Okay, let's go. We going in, too? Yeah, sure. Suppose she pulls the same stunt. Oh, she wouldn't dare. I hope we don't run into the house, Dick. Yeah, I don't see him. That's all we need right now. You know Dixie's room number, Mr. Harrigan? Uh, it's on the second floor. 227, I think. I thought it was 237. Never mind, I asked the dust clerk. You, mister. Yes, sir? Can I help you? Will you be so kindly to announce you one of to Miss Dixie Davenport? Miss Davenport? What's the matter? You're deaf? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Davenport isn't here. What do you mean she's not here? She checked out, sir, almost an hour ago. At the desk clerk's startling announcement, Hop and Tank can only stare in amazement. Even the bombastic movie director is at a loss for words. Gang, there are more surprises ahead, so stand by. <laughs> Fellas and girls, our special guest today is the first prize winner of the name Hop Harrigan's Plane Contest. He's 11-year-old Kenneth Bonham of Chicago, Illinois. Ken, suppose I try to describe you to the gang. I'd say you were about uh, 4 feet 10 inches tall. 4'11", Mr. Riggs. <laughs> I was close. Now, I suppose you tell us about yourself, Ken. All right. I weigh about 80 pounds, and I'm interested in most sports. My main interests, though, are music, science, reading, and, of course, aviation. I understand you build model planes. Yes, I do. Uh, excuse me, did I hear you mention model planes? That's how I learned all about flying. Used to build all kinds of models when I was a kid. Oh, Ken, do you know Tank Tinker? Yes, I've met Hop and Tank before the show today. Say, can I get a word in? Sure thing, Hop. Well, Ken, I want to thank you for naming my new plane for me. And it's a swell name, too. And it just occurred to me that it might be a good idea to tell all our listeners the name that won first prize for you. I'd be glad to, Hop. I named the plane Zodiacobat. Boy, that sure is a tricky name, Ken. How did you choose it? Well, I guess I decided on Zodiacobat, because whenever I look up and see a plane flying overhead, it reminds me of an aquabat flying through the air. Since the solar system is known as the Zodiac, just combine the two and got Zodiac I see. And it won first prize out of the thousands of names sent in. I'd like to talk with you longer, Ken, but we've got to get back to the program now. Thanks so much for your visit with us today, and I do hope you and your mother have a swell time in New York. So long. So long, Mr. Riggs. So long, Hop. So long, Tank. Good luck, Ken. Oh, Ken. <laughs> Fellas and girls, whether you like to build model planes or pilot real ones, always remember America needs flyers. And now back to our story. With the news that Dixie Davenport had checked out of her hotel, Hop and Tank were stymied. They had no way of tracing her, and so headed back for the location camp in their beach craft. Ivan Ivanov, the explosive director, along as a rather reluctant passenger. Give me 
with Mr. Arrigan. It is absolutely necessary to fly so high from the ground. That's much safer up here, Mr. Ivanov. Safer? That does not make sense. The higher we go, the more we fall and the harder we hit. Well, we aren't going to fall. Are you quite sure? Ah, sure as I can be about anything. Of course, funny things happen sometimes. The propeller can fly off. You can lose a wing. What? what, what? It's happened. It's hang. Uh, so what do you do then? Well, you look for a cloud and get out and walk. Uh-huh. Uh, but the sky is clear. I, I see no clouds. Well, that makes it pretty tough. Get out and walk on the cloud. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, tell me, so how do you get down from the cloud? You wait till the cloud bumps into a mountain, then you jump off. Of course, sometimes they don't hit mountains. Well, what happens? We lose more people that way. <laughs> Mr. Tinker, you're pulling my arm, yes? Oh, I wouldn't think of it. <laughs> Cut it out, Tank. There's the camp. Stand by for landing. Roger. Mr. Harrigan, what are you doing? There's landing, sir. There's the location camp. Oh, so you'll be careful, yes? Don't worry. Where's the flaps, Tank? We're in the wind. Check. Wheels down. Flaps down. Thanks. Coming in kind of high, ain't we? Yeah, I'll slip her in. What? What you call me? Take it easy, Mr. Ivanoff. But, but, but you are flying the plane sideways. Relax, sir. Everything's all right. There. Okay. Going in. Oh. Oh. We're on the ground. Feel better now, oh. Mr. Ivanoff? No. Oh, my stomach. Tank, check me over to the mooring ropes. Hold her straight. Car waiting. I think Mr. Peabody's in it. Mr. Peabody? Good. You will have it by carbonate for me. What, if, what do you figure on doing now, Hot? Now we'll have another talk with Joe Bell. Going to make him tell us where he landed the C-47? Right. He said he was all mixed up. He didn't know where he went down. We'll make him remember. Okay, pilot. Go ahead, Mr. Ivano. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ivano! Mr. Ivanov? Yes, Mr. Peabody, I heard you the second time. Do not shop. Oh, here's your bicarbonate, Mr. Ivanov. Oh. That guy's a walking drugstore. Oh, so that is better. Now, Mr. Harrigan, as I am to understand everything, you wish to speak to Mr. Bell. You believe he will help us find Miss Davenport? Yes, I think he can tell us where she's gone. Miss Davenport? But she was here, sir. When was Dixie's darling here? How do you like that? Why you don't tell me? Why, I... Blackhead! Ah, Mr. Harrigan, we go to our dressing room. But, Mr. Ivanov, she isn't there now. What? She left. What kind of a merry-go-round is this? Where did she go? I'm sure I wouldn't know. Well, come on, let's talk to Joe Bell. He's gone, too. He's nobody here? Who let him go? Miss Dixie, sir. She insisted that he be released. She gave him one of the company cars, and he drove away. When? At least an hour ago, perhaps longer. Oh, Lord, then we'll never catch him. Ah, what's going on? What's that dame up to? I wish I knew, Tank. I wish I knew... Shaking his head in utter bewilderment, Pop is the picture of confusion. He cannot figure out Dixie's reasoning. What is the young star planning to do, and why did she release Joe Bell? We'll learn more tomorrow, gang, so be sure to listen. Tune in and fly with Pop Harrigan, America's ace of the airways. So long, Hop! We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Pop Harrigan is a transcribed copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines. America's ace of the airways. CX-4 calling control tower. CX-4 calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower back to CX-4. Wind southeast. Ceiling 1200. All clear. Okay. This is Hop Harrigan. Coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. Gang, today we have an important message from the United States Air Force. 
the organization with which Hop Harrigan flew during the war and which today is starting on a new peacetime expansion program. The Air Force has a brand new system called the Aviation Career Plan. This means that any one of you fellows listening can join the Air Force for three years of highly specialized training after you graduate from high school. And what's most important, before you enlist, you choose which one of more than 40 different jobs you want to train for. I guess you remember that during the war, men didn't always get the sort of job they wanted. Sometimes a G.I. who wanted to be an aerial photographer ended up as a cook or a baker. Well, that was just one of those unfortunate things which happened under the stress of war. But that's all over now. Today, if you enlist to become an aircraft mechanic or a radio operator, a welder, a draftsman, an electrician, a diesel mechanic, a sheet metal worker, or even a control tower operator, well, that's exactly what you become. Think of it. Complete training in a specialized field, a chance to serve your country and preserve the peace, a chance to travel, and you'll be paid, too, and given your room and board and clothing. It's really something to think about. Because you fellows who are going to be 17 soon could come out of the Air Force at 20 after three years of fine experience, specially prepared to take your place in the civilian world as a trained specialist. I'll tell you more about the Air Force career plan and flying cadet training later. So don't forget to listen. And now to our story. Puzzled by Dixie Davenport's refusal of their help and her later disappearance from the Timberline Hotel in the desert town of Barstow, Hoff and Tank flew back to the motion picture location camp where they hoped to force Joe Bell, Dixie's pilot, to reveal where he had flown the Wonder Horse, Sequoia. But there they were met by still another surprise. Dixie had returned to the camp, had released Joe, and had again disappeared. Now it is the morning after a very restless night. The boys are dressing, and Tank is, as usual, grumbling his displeasure. If it was up to me, I'd say forget the whole thing. If you don't want our help, let her get it in the neck. See if I care. Ah, now, Tank, that's no way to act. I suppose she's acting nice. What a routine. It ain't enough she gets a slap in a jug, but then she goes and turns loose the, the one guy who's got all the dope. Well, Dixie didn't know Joe was working for Regan. Well, if she stopped to think a minute, she could have figured it out easy enough. Oh, well, forget it, Tank. Are you uh, ready to go? Just a second. I'm going to put on my tie. What? A tie? You've never worn a tie in your life. So what? It's high time I started, ain't it? Oh, but why? Well, it makes you... Makes you look better. Oh, I see. This movie life's really going to your head, isn't it? Oh, I'll lay you off. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty nifty, eh? Ah. Now, come on, I'm ready. Let's get down to the mess shack before them wolves polish off all the breakfast. Well, that sounds normal, at least. Go ahead, then. Thanks. Gosh, sure is a pretty day. Yeah, be perfect for shooting aerial scenes. Well, how can we without Dixie? Well, who knows, maybe Ivanoff will get another one of his inspirations and figure out a way to shoot around her. But, Tank, look. Huh? Where? There's Dixie's convertible, parked next to her tent. Yeah. Up in Jenny's, and she's back. Come on. We gonna see her? Of course we are. Oh, what's the use? We'll only get another brush off. Well, she can't call the police here, that's one thing. I thought we was gonna leave her alone and let her fight her own battles. That was your idea, not mine. Well, oh, Hop, if you keep sticking your nose in where it ain't wanted, you're gonna get it cut off. Yeah, shut up now. Here? Good morning, Dixie. It's Hop. Oh, just a minute, please. Hmm. She ain't exactly cheering because we're here. I'll lay off, will you? What's taking her so long? She's getting dressed, you idiot. Oh. Huh? Here she comes. Morning, Hop. Tank. Hello, Dixie. Morning. Come on in. Thanks. Getting dressed, is she? She ain't even been to bed. Tank, shut up. Well? Well? I suppose I should apologize for what happened yesterday, but it was your own fault, boys. Our fault? You wouldn't listen to me. I begged you to leave me alone and come back here, but you refused. There was nothing else I could do. Okay, Dixie. You had to play it that way. You had to. No harm done. Thank you, Hop. I knew you'd understand. Oh, but I, I don't. 
You still haven't told us why you wouldn't let us help. I can't tell you, Hop. This is something I have to work out by myself. Dixie, is it working out? Are you getting what you want? Yes. You sure? Everything will be fine if no one interferes. Dixie, how can you trust Regan? It isn't a question of trust. He has Sequoia, so I have to do what he says. Uh, I suppose he promised to give him back to you? Yes, he did. Hmm. You believe I have to believe him. Dixie, what about Joe Bell? What about him? Why did you let him go? What right did you have to treat him like a criminal? Because he is one. He and Regan are in cahoots. I don't believe it. Why, I'd trust Joe with everything I own. Ah, women can't see two inches in front of their nose. Lay off, Tank. Dixie, where did you send Joe? I... I can't tell you. You've got to. Hop Harrigan, I won't stand for this. How dare you question me? What I do is my own business. But can't you see that you... Excuse me. Hop, what's the use? You're beating your head against a stone wall. But I've got to make her understand, Tank. Yes? Special delivery letter for you, Miss Devonport. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, Miss Devonport. Hop. Yes? I don't think there's anything more we have to say to each other. Oh? Okay, Tank. Come on. I, uh... I'm sorry, Hop. That's okay. But whatever you do, Dixie, watch out. Don't trust Regan or Joe Bell. Very well. All right, Tank. Well, I guess that washes us up good. Let's go have breakfast before I lose my appetite. No, Tank. Duck around here behind the property tent. Huh? What for? Something's up. How do you know? Dixie very carefully hid that special delivery behind her back when we left. So what? She don't want us to help. Let's... Wait. She's coming out. Stay back. I still don't see what you... Hold it, will you? Yeah. She's going to her car. Uh Pulling a disappearing act again. She's in a hurry. Ain't she always? Wonder what was in that letter. Don't you wonder where she's going? Yeah, but we can always catch up to her in the plane. Well, look, how long are we going to stand here? Relax, Tank. Okay, she's out of sight. Let's go. At last, I'm starving. Sorry to disappoint you, pal. No breakfast yet. All right. Then where are we going? To Dixie's dressing room. What for? I want to find out what was in that letter if we can. Hey, that ain't nice. She ain't gonna like that. It's the only way we can help her, and we've got to. Now, let's see. I don't see it. Must have took it with her. Hey, wait a minute. You got it? I think so. It's here in the wastebasket. Good. Uh, no, that's only the envelope. Uh, hey, but look at the return address. Huh? The Citizens Bank of Los Angeles. Hmm? So what? Don't you understand, Tank? Understand why? Add it up. Sequoia's stolen. Dixie meets the man who stole him, Regan. And now she gets a special delivery letter from a bank. Jumping Jenny's maybe... Maybe it's the payoff. No, maybe he's about it. Get down to the strip and start warming up the beach. I'm going to check on this, and we've got to move fast. At the driving urgency in Hop's voice, Tank stifles the questions crowding his lips and rushes out of Dixie's dressing room. Hop leaves also, but turns in the direction of Ivan Ivanov's quarters. But what can the boys do? What if Dixie turns on them again? You won't want to miss the climax of today's episode, gang, so stand by. Now, gang, let me tell you some more about Air Force recruiting. During the next nine months, more than 8,500 enlisted men are needed. And remember, once you're part of the Air Force team, you can apply for officer candidate school because the Air Force wants to train 500 enlisted men a month as officers. You can even become a flyer. You see, there are really two ways to become a flyer, or a bombardier, or a navigator. One way is to join the Air Force, get as much ground training as possible, and then, when you're 19 years old, apply to become a cadet. Young men coming out of high school at 17 or 18 years would find that plan workable. However, anyone between 19 and 26 and a half years can apply directly for cadet training from civilian life if he can pass an examination or has two years of college work. During the last part of the war, and up until just recently, no civilian outside the Air Force could become a cadet. All cadets were drawn directly from the ranks. Well, now the door is open. One of the secrets of success of the Air Force has been the kind of men that has found to fill its positions. Eager, hard-working young men who know the future is in the air. 
Men like your pal, Tom Harrigan and Tank Tinker. Of course, we've just given you the highlights on this. You and your friends and your family will want to know more about it. So if you do, send a letter to the Commanding General of the Air Force in Washington, D.C. Or better yet, drop in at the recruiting station in your hometown or the nearest large city. They'll give you the kind of information you can talk over with your family and teachers. Information that will help you decide how the Air Force can help you find a real future in an air-minded America. So, fellas and girls, always remember, America needs flyers. And now, back to our story. A half hour has passed since Hop's discovery of the envelope from a Los Angeles bank in Dixie's dressing room... And now the boys are on the way to Barstow again, crowding every ounce of speed out of their powerful beach craft. Pop is explaining to his mechanic pal. Just the way we figured, Tank. Dixie withdrew some money from her bank in Los Angeles. She got a check in that envelope this morning. How much? Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand... How <whistles> horse is worth that much? Sequoia is to Dixie. Who told you all this? Ivanov called the bank. They didn't want to tell him anything, of course, but you know him. He started throwing his weight around and scared them, I guess. Yeah, I can imagine. So the bank told him that Dixie had been there yesterday and arranged for the withdrawal. They sent her a bank check. Yeah, but what good's the check? Regan won't take nothing but cash if he's smart. The check is made out to a bank in Barstow. What's the idea of that? Uh, Dixie's probably going to cash the check there. Well, what can we do about it? We can't stop them. Maybe not, but we'll do something. You mean we'll go to the bank? Yes. Yeah. If Dixie sees us, two to one, she'll start yelling that we're trying to hold up this joint. Hey, what in the world? What's up? There's a DC-3 up there. Where? I'm back of us. I noticed it a couple of minutes ago. It was high, cutting over our course. Now, it, now it's lining up with us. Hey, it, it's coming down. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. Hey, what the dickens is he doing? I don't know. I... Tank, tank, it's Dixie's plane. A reconverted C-47. And Joe Bell must be at the controls. Hey, you don't suppose he's bringing Sequoia back, do you? Back nothing. He's got a machine gun aboard. He's trying to shoot us down. Tank, duck! Wow, he's pulverizing us. Get out, how quick! I can't, he's sitting right on top of us. Hey, hold her! Tank, the controls are gone. They're shot away. Brace yourself, we're going down. Even as Hop shouts his desperate warning, the Beechcraft suddenly noses up in a dangerous whip stall, then falls off on one wing and corkscrews earthward, spinning down completely out of control. Gang, there's action ahead and suspense, so don't miss the next thrill packed episode. Tune in and fly with Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airways. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Whoa, Hop and Tank did what? Okay, anyways, that was the halfway point of the listen-along. It is now time for the five-minute break, so go ahead. Uh, if you don't have anything to do, we have music. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in five minutes. Bye.
This marks the end of the five minute break. Uh, I hope you guys like the music. I hope you guys did what you wanted. And uh, yeah, let's get back to Hop and Tank's excellent adventure. I really hope you guys got that joke. If you didn't, I'm gonna be sad. Okay, Hop and Tank, woo, yeah. Presenting Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. 
CX-4, calling control tower. CX-4, calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower, back to CX-4. Wind, southeast, ceiling 1,200. All clear. Okay, this is Hop Harrigan. Coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. And this is Glenn Riggs coming in to ask a question. What does a young boy do when he gets lost? Usually he hollers for help and someone finds him and leads him home. Well, that's what happened recently to a light airplane flying over Cleveland. Patrick Anderson was returning after dark from Youngstown in his Aronka. He got confused by the city's lights and first landed at the lakefront airstrip. He then asked the Cleveland Airport Tower for compass directions and took off. But sometime later, Anderson again radioed the tower. He still was lost. Well, at that point, Captain Harry Bitterman, pilot of a United Airlines plane, heard of Anderson's predicament and promised to keep a lookout for him when he took off from Cleveland for Chicago. A short time out, Captain Bitterman radioed the tower that he spotted a small plane. And the tower told Anderson to blink the lights of his Aronka. He did that, and the airline pilot recognized the ship. Then Anderson was told to follow the United plane back to Cleveland. A few minutes later, the big mainliner crossed over the airfield with a tiny Aronka following close behind, safe at home at last. And say, gang, here's another out-of-the-ordinary aviation item. Did you know that the foggiest airport in the country, the one at Arcata, California, has been approved by the Civil Aeronautics Administration for landings under almost any weather conditions? Sounds a little fantastic, but there's a good reason for it. The Arcata Field is an experimental station where nearly all the known fog-eliminating devices are being tested. I've got some more interesting aviation stories, and I'll be back to tell them at the end of the program, so don't forget to listen. And now to our story. Hop and Tank have discovered that Dixie Davenport has withdrawn $50,000 from her Los Angeles bank, which she planned to deposit in a small bank in the desert town of Barstow. Fearing that Tex Regan, the man they are certain kidnapped her horse, Sequoia, would somehow double-cross her, the boys headed for Barstow in their plane. But as you recall, they were intercepted en route by Dixie's own plane, a reconverted C-47, obviously piloted by Joe Bell, Dixie's pilot. The twin-engine transport roared down on the beachcraft, and a machine gun suddenly opened up. Burst after burst poured into their plane, and before Hop could maneuver out of the trap, the beach whipped over on one wing, corkscrewing earthward in an uncontrollable spin. Pull her out, Hop! Pull her out! I don't think I can! The rudder pedals don't answer! Oh, my gosh! Maybe I can level up with my ailerons and the trim tabs. Move fast! The ground's coming off the boat! Here goes! Come on, baby! Come on! Give her more power! yourself and pray the wings don't come off. Baby, please hold together. Don't pull apart on us now. Here we go. Tank, we're level. I, I can't believe it. Now we'll have to sit down fast. Sit down? There ain't nothing but hills under us. I think I see open ground through that pass. You ain't got any rudder. I know it. Oh, I can't look. Tank, keep your eyes open and watch for the C-47. Bob, Joe Bell's coming down to get after us. If we can get through that pass, he won't be able to follow. Throttle wide open in the slot. Gosh, if he starts with that Tommy gun now, he'll get us good. Almost to the pass. Stand by. He's still crowding our tail. Why don't he open up? Don't ask for it. Okay, going through. Wow, he pulled up. He had to. Hey, look, Tank, I was right. There is open ground. That field ahead is as smooth as a billiard table. Working our way for a change. Okay, we're through the pass. I'm going in. Give me wheels and flaps. We're landing it downwind. There's enough room, and I don't want to chance any turns without a rudder. Okay, wheels down. Flaps 20. Jack, stand by. I wonder where the C-47 is. Watch for it. Flying in. Make it good. Brother, we sure are landing high. We'll be all right. We'll take a long roll out. Hope we don't run into no ditches. We won't. It's smooth and level. There. Everything's under control now. 
Wow. Never thought we'd make it. Now taxi over to that clump of trees in case... In case of what? Not a surprise visit. The trees will give us some cover. I don't see the transport. Oh, yes, I do. He's coming over the hills. I thought so. He's looking for us. Now, this is about as far as we can go. Pile out. He's cutting west. I'll keep back. Still holding course. Ain't turning any. Good. Then we're okay. Now, wait a minute. He's climbing. He has to if he's going to clear that other range of hills. Maybe he'll turn back. No, no, he ain't. He's going right over. Whoopee. Oh, that's a relief. Now, let's see what shape the beach is in. Boy, look at them wings. The bottom one on this side especially. It's like a soup strainer. No structural damage, though. I want to see the rudder. Come on. If it's shot up bad, we'll have a sweet time getting out of here. A tank, look. It's hardly been scratched. Then what? Oh, here. The rudder cable. One of the slugs must have nicked it and gave way. Can you fix it? Yeah, sure. There's some spare cable in the toolkit. Give me 15 minutes and the... Rudder will be good as new. Swell. We've got to reach that bank in Barstow before Dixie leaves. So in a matter of seconds, Tank is splicing on a new rudder cable. Pop, meanwhile, keeps careful watch on the sky above, fearing the return of Joe Bell in the C-47. But there's no further interruption, and Tank completes his task in less than the promised time. A half hour later, they circle the small private field at Barstow and, landing quickly, proceed to the bank. Hey, look, Hop, there's Dixie's convertible parked right in front of the bank. Thank goodness she's still here. Step it up. We going in? Of course. What if she sees us? We'll do our best to keep out of sight. Here's the entrance. Keep your eyes open for her. Check. See ya. No. Walk forward. Over to that desk. I don't think she's here, Hop. I don't see her. Keep going. But what'll we do? Take it easy. Now, take a deposit slip and a pen. Make believe you're... You're filling it out. Oh, why all the hocus-pocus? Dixie ain't here, I tell you. She must be, or her car wouldn't be parked outside. Maybe she crawled under a desk. <laughs> don't be funny. This is a small bank. They don't handle sums like $50,000 every day. She wouldn't be dealing with a teller. Who then? Hey, move over to that door marked private. Take the pen and the deposit slip with you. There's a desk there. Hey, look, they're going to start to get suspicious sooner. Before you know it, they'll call the cops. Do as I say. Hey, who's that? The president of the bank. That's his office. We can hear him through the transom. Hold it. Jumping Jenny's at Dixie. Now, why don't you shout it from the rooftops? You wish to deposit this certified check for $50,000 in our bank. That's right. Hmm. And you're to give the money, the entire amount, to anyone who presents this letter. May I see the letter, please? Certainly. Hey, what's going on, Hop? Dixie's playing this smarter than I thought she would. Well, now, what's to prevent this letter falling into the hands of an unauthorized person, Miss Davenport? If it does, I'll be out $50,000. Wouldn't it be far safer for you to give us the name of the individual who will call for the money so that we can insist... So why identification? I don't know his name. You mean to tell me, Miss Davenport, you're entrusting that amount of money to a person whose name you don't know? I advise against it. I advise very strongly against it. Good for oh, you. I cannot help myself. It must be done this way. Would you care to tell me why? I'm sorry, sir. I can't tell you. But take my word for it. Miss Davenport, please don't think it presumptuous of me, but uh, is someone forcing you to pay this money? Hey, that guy's right on the beam. Hey, I... Shh. I can't answer that question. Obviously, someone is. My advice to you, Miss Davenport, is not to pay it. It must be paid to whoever presents that letter. But, uh... But suppose a copy is made and your signature forged. If you sign the letter, endorse it, that possibility will be eliminated. Uh, very well, Miss Davenport. But I'm doing this against my better judgment. There you are. This letter will be honored as a withdrawal draft in the amount of $50,000 to be paid to better. Oh, thank you, sir. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must rush. Of course. Me Tank, she's coming out. Jenny, oh, let's beat it. It's too late. Turn around, concentrate on this paper, and don't move. Hunched over the high desk, literally frozen, Hop and Tank wait anxiously as Dixie Davenport and the president of the bank stand within arm's length. Will she recognize them? And if she does, what then? 
Well, we'll know in a moment, gang, so stand by. Most of you have probably taken auto trips at one time or another. If you have, you'll recall that many of the roads, even those out in the country, are lined with billboards advertising everything from soup to nuts. Up to now, airplane passengers and pilots didn't have billboards staring them in the face. But that may all change if a new Boston company makes a go of its new product. They're experimenting with billboards for flyers. The company surveys the territory in which an advertiser is interested. Then it designs and supervises construction of government-approved air markers. Federal regulations say that 20% of the area of those air markers can be used for advertising. The markers can be painted rooftops, or they may take the form of landscaping, using crushed stones for lettering. So if you take a plane trip in the future, don't be too surprised when you look down on a peaceful countryside and see a giant sign that might read, Podunk Airport, one mile, eat at Harry's place. (laughs) One survey already made shows there's a potential readership of better than one million in scheduled transport flights between Boston and New York. Here's another story all tied up with the air age. One college is making sure that high school students don't get ahead of their teachers when it comes to information on the air age. The University of Illinois has started a course in flying for all people who want to be high school teachers. About 75 students now are getting their first instruction on what high school teachers should know about flying so that they'll be able to answer the questions of their teenage students. Well, that's just another sign that the age of aviation is coming into its own. A career in the air is all yours for the asking, if you're well prepared for it. So always remember, America needs flyers. And now back to our story. On reaching the bank in Barstow, Hop and Tank stood outside the door of the bank president's office and through the transom overheard the arrangements Dixie Davenport made for the payment of $50,000. But before they could get away, Dixie walked to the door, opened it, and came out. Thank you very much, sir. You don't know how much you've helped me. Glad to be of service, Miss Davenport. Please call on me at any time. I certainly will. Thank you again and goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, Casey? Yes, sir? Escort Miss Davenport to her car, please. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Phew. That was close. And how? If she'd seen us, Lord knows what would have happened. Well, oh, come on. We can get out now. No. Wait till she drives away. Wait, are we going to follow her? Sure we are, by plane. We'll give her a little head start. And there she goes. Yeah, then let's make tracks. Go ahead. Thanks. Let's see, we'll get to the beach faster if we grab a cab. I don't see any around. Hey, watch yourself, there's a car pulling up fast. Hey, what's he want, the whole street? Come on down to the corner. Okay. Just a minute, partner. Huh? Tank, it's Regan. Jumping Jenny. Hey, looking for a lift? I'll be glad to oblige. Oh, you will, will you? Watch it. He's got a gun. I'll say I've got a gun. Now, come on, boys. Climb in. You and me are going places. For a split second, Hop and Tank hesitate, for their first impulse is to try to make a break for it. But as Regan slowly lifts his gun, they give up all thought of escape and climb into his car. Gang, there's plenty of action and excitement ahead, so don't miss the next episode. Tune in and fly with Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Harrigan is a transcribed copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazine and is brought to you Monday through Friday, same time, same mutual station. America's ace of the airways. CX-4 calling control tower. CX-4 calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower back to CX-4. Wind southeast. Ceiling 1200. All clear. Okay, this is Hop Harrigan. 
coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. Gang, in the early days of aviation, airplanes were simple machines. A few minutes' instruction at the time of purchase was enough to give a new owner all the details of maintenance and flight. But airplanes have grown more and more complicated through the years until today they're really complex. Flying, servicing, and keeping these planes in good shape is something you can't learn overnight. When a new plane comes out on the market today, it takes the skill of top-grade instructors to teach the ABCs of that new ship to a buyer. The need for instruction is so important today that most purchase contracts include a section for training the buyer's crews in the right way to care for the new airplane. One of the pioneers in this kind of instruction is the Boeing Aircraft Company. During the war, Boeing had Flying Fortress and Super Fortress schools in Seattle, and they trained more than 40,000 men there. You remember that these men serviced and maintained the huge bomber fleets that carried destruction to the heart of Germany and Japan. After the war... Boeing thought it would be a good idea to carry the schools over to the civil aviation field. Airlines were starting to expand at that time, and so Boeing thought it could make an important contribution toward increasing both the safety and general knowledge of its aircraft. The best way to tell airline ground crews how to service new planes was to send them to a school that knew all about the ship. The outcome of that today is the Boeing Stratocruiser School at Seattle. And in just a few minutes, I'll be back to tell you all about it. So don't forget to listen. And now to our story. In spite of her refusal of assistance and her obstinate attempts to get them out of the way, Hop and Tank are still trying to help Dixie Davenport recover her horse, Sequoia, stolen by a burly cowhand, Tex Regan. The boys followed the beautiful young movie star to a bank in the desert town of Barstow, and there overheard her making arrangements for a payment of $50,000 to the person presenting a certain letter then in her possession. Obviously, Dixie was planning to pay ransom for the horse, but Hop was afraid Regan would double-cross her. Then, yesterday, Hop and Tank left the bank a few minutes after Dixie, planning to catch up to her on the road out of town, but suddenly a car pulled up alongside, the rear door opened, and they heard a voice say, Can I give you a lift, partner? Jump a jetty, Sex Regan. Come on inside, fellas. You bet I will. I'm going to tear you apart. Watch the tank. He's got a gun. And I'm pretty good with it, if I do say so. Inside, fellas. Pronto. What's the idea? I'll tell you about it sometime. Are you coming in, or do I fill you full of lead and leave you in the gutter? Come on, tank. We can't do anything else. One at a time. So I can watch you both. Tigger, you sit in that corner. Stay put. And now you, Harrigan. Regan, what are you doing this for? Don't ask so many questions, because you won't like the answers. Now, close the door. All right, Joe. Roll her. Joe. Hey, look who's here. The hotshot pilot himself. Shut up, Tinker. Don't talk to me like that, you little punk. Sit still, Tinker. Easy, Tank. Losing your temper won't get you anywhere. That's a smart way to figure it, Harrigan. Won't get him nowhere but a coffin. All right, Regan. Why don't we cut the chatter and get down to cases? Uh, Sure, sure. Anything you say, partner. Then suppose you start talking. What's the idea? The idea is that you two are sticking your noses where they don't belong. I aim to see that stopped right now. Huh? How? By taking care of you in my own special way. <laughs> Step it up, will you, Joe? Well, I have the cops on our tail. I'm doing 50 now. Oh, you ain't got all day. So you sold her out, Joe. Miss Davenport trusted you, and you sold her out. Shut up, will you? Now, Joe, he's only trying to get your coat. Well, make him lay off. Uh, sure, sure. Now you keep your eyes on the road. Stop gabbing and tell us where we're going. Where well, you won't uh, get in my way again. That tells me a lot. I said where? To a little place I know up in the valley. Off by itself. Nobody around for miles. <laughs> and the weather's getting pretty good, too. The weather? Yeah. See them clouds up there? Being fly boys, you, you ought to know what to mean. Sure, rain. Rain. And plenty of it. It really comes down in these parts. Comes down hard and fast. What are you driving at? Oh, nothing much. I only hope this little place I'm taking you to don't, uh, <laughs> don't leak. Listen, Tex, what about Miss Davenport? What about her, partner? Are you going to give her back Sequoia? Sequoia? You mean a horse? You know doggone well what I mean. Appears to me you're right in the wrong range, partner. 
How can I give Sequoia back to her when I ain't got it? You're a liar. Listen, man. Regan, we know you have Sequoia. We know you and Joe Bell fixed up the whole deal between you. You've demanded $50,000. You know an awful lot, Harrigan. Are you going to come through, or aren't you? That all depends. But sure as the day is long, you two ain't going to know about it. Now shut up! Step on it, Joe. Let's get this over with. In answer to Regan's curt command, Joe forces the accelerator down to the floorboards, and the sedan roars down the empty desert road. Twenty minutes later, Joe turns off into a narrow winding lane, and after a rough, dusty half mile, stops the car in front of a weather beaten shack, surrounded on all sides by high canyon walls. At gunpoint, Hop and Tank are forced out, and as they walk over the hard, dry ground, the first threat of the advancing storm rumbles in the distance. Hear that, Joe? Sounds like the weather is going to be just right. You sure this will work, Tex? Positive. Ah, yeah. What are they talking about? Why is the weather so important? Yeah, you've got me. Maybe we can break clear. I'll hurt you, Tinker. And any time you feel like running a race with this year 45, I'll be glad to oblige. Tank, be careful. Inside, boys. Go on over to those chairs and sit down. Hop, we gotta make a break or we're dead pigeons. I know it. Stand by. Cooking up something, huh? What? Well, I'll take care of that right now. Tank, watch it! Oh, oh you dirty... Joe, Joe, at Harrigan! Oh. <coughs> well, nice work, Joe. He was asking for it. Okay, now, let's finish up. And listen, Joe. <laughs> the weather's gonna be just right. <laughs> Tex Regan laughs triumphantly, then, with the help of his accomplice, Joe Bell, he ties Hop and Tank, both unconscious, to the two chairs in the center of the dirty room. A few minutes later, outside the shack, he stares up at the gradually darkening sky and, smiling his satisfaction, climbs into the sedan with Joe, and they drive away. A half hour later, back on the main road again, they slow down as they approach a convertible parked on the shoulder. There she is, Joe. She follows instructions good. Pull up behind the car. Okay. You know what you're supposed to do. Yeah, don't worry. Okay. Go ahead. Miss Davenport! Miss Davenport! Oh, Joe. What took you so long? I've been waiting almost to know. Sorry we were held up. Is... Is Tex Regan with you? I sure am, Miss Davenport. Well, where's Sequoia? You promised me you'd bring Sequoia. In time, ma'am, in time. I had to make sure first. Make sure of what? That you'd play ball and wouldn't bring the cops into this. I promised I wouldn't. All I want is Sequoia. Oh, sure, ma'am. Just uh, suppose you climb in the car and uh, we'll talk about it. Talk? There's nothing to talk about. Better do as he says, Miss Davenport. All right. That's more friendly, like, man. I don't care about being friends with you, Tex Regan. No. Where's Sequoia? Uh, where's the money? I have it. Mind if I see the color of it? I don't have it in cash. What do you mean? You're trying to cross me? No. I have a letter made out to the bank in Barstow. There's $50,000 on deposit there, which can be withdrawn in cash by the person who presents the letter. <laughs> don't sound right to me. I'm not exactly a fool, Tex. I want to see Sequoia first. Let's see that letter. It's in my purse. You'll get Your it. Your purse, eh? Well, thank you, ma'am. Hey, give it back to me. Give it back. Now, you sit quiet and you won't get hurt, ma'am. Okay, Joe, shut the door. Joe, you know what to do. Right. Meet you at the ranch. Joe, where are you going? Come back, Joe. Save your voice, ma'am. Joe's working for me now. Where... Where are you taking me? You want to see your horse Sequoia, don't you, ma'am? Well, Tex Regan aims to keep his promise to you. <laughs> so, in the short space of an hour, Tex Regan seems to have won two important victories. He has Dixie's letter, and Hop and Tank are lying unconscious in a shack in the canyon. Things are going to happen, gang, so stand by. When Boeing decided to open a school for airline ground crews, the company had a good deal of experience through the training courses they gave during the war. Yet, in spite of that, company officers consulted fully with the six major world airlines who soon will be flying the new Boeing Stratocruiser. Boeing asked these airline customers just what they'd like included in the training course, and they came back with a lot of requests. 
The two most asked for were specialist classes for men who work only on certain parts of the plane and a general familiarization course for supervisors and others who must have an overall knowledge of the ship. The Boeing Service Department worked these suggestions, as well as many others, into the training course. Finally, out of all the conferences came a business-like three-week course with two types of study. For pilots, flight engineers, and supervisors who must know all parts of the ship, the entire three weeks are taken up with a general study of the mechanism. For others who want to specialize, the work is divided into two parts. One week of general familiarization, followed by two weeks of training in their specialization. All this work of organizing was done months ago, long before the first stratocruiser was ready to roll off the assembly line. The airlines which buy the ships must have crews trained and ready to take over the moment the new planes are delivered. Airline personnel who have taken the course and received the stratocruiser school certificate really know they've got the best three-week training in the industry. American aviation always strives for the best gang in planes, service, everything. And say, if any of you want to join the growing circle of aviation men and women when you get older, get ready now, for always remember, America needs flyers. And now back to our story. Although it is only mid-afternoon, the sky above the canyon is black as night. Vivid streaks of blue-white lightning fork through tumbled masses of storm clouds, and the thunder echoes and re-echoes in almost continual rolls. The rain beats down on the roof of the shack and leaks through into its one room as Tank slowly regains consciousness. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, that, that's you, Tank? Yeah, sure. Come on, snap out of it. Give me a second. Oh, my head. Yeah, mine don't feel so good neither. But you got to pull yourself together. Yeah, I'm okay now. Hey, what happened, anyhow? Uh, Regan and Joe Bell must have knocked us out and then tied us up. Where did I get my hands on I'll them? Save your strength. See if you can get loose. Uh, uh, that's not a chance. Yeah. I guess you're right. Sounds pretty rough outside. It's rough in here, too. Roof's got more holes than a soup strainer. That's what Regan said he wanted. Why, Harper? I still don't understand why. Uh, neither do I. Huh. Coming down in buckets here. Can't even see out the window. Hey, Hop, we gotta do something. We gotta get out of here. Doesn't seem to be much we can do. Hey, look. Huh? What's the matter? Water's coming in under the door. Water? Yeah, and up through the floor. Maybe Regan wants us to catch ammonia. No, thanks. Listen. Huh? There's water coming down the canyon. Don't be Jenny's. Sounds like a river. It is a river. This shack's in a dried-up river bed. Oh, my gosh. And the water's rising. It's over our ankles already. Up, we'll, we'll be drowned. The roar of the storm almost covers Tank's cry of despair, and the boys redouble their efforts to free themselves from their bonds. But the ropes hold, cutting into their flesh. Gang, you won't want to miss the next episode, so tune in and fly with Hop. Allegan, America's ace of the airways. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Hop Harrigan is a transcribed copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines. America's ace of the airways. CX-4 calling control tower. CX-4 calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower back to CX-4. Wind southeast. Ceiling 1200. All clear. Okay. This is Hop Harrigan. Coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. Every 
once in a while, fellas and girls, I run across an aviation story that almost makes me believe planes are human. Well, that may sound silly to you, but a lot of our wartime airmen will back me up. Some planes, riddled with hundreds of bullets, somehow got back to home base, although from their condition they should have fallen apart. Flyers say ships like that wanted to get back, and no matter what happened to them, they wouldn't go down. This story I'm going to tell you is post-war, but I think it shows that a plane can have a mind of its own. It's about a Navy PBY-5 Catalina, nicknamed fondly by Navy pilots Reluctant Ronald. Here's how Ronald got his name. A Navy crew was assigned to fly Ronald across country from Philadelphia to Seattle. Everything was going along on schedule until they were over Arizona. Then Ronald got temperamental. He developed engine trouble, and the crew looked around for a spot to make an emergency landing. Well, they found one in Lake Carl Pleasant, an artificial lake right in the heart of the Arizona desert. On the first landing attempt, Ronald came in over the dam, but then the crew found the water was so low that the plane couldn't lose enough altitude to get into the lake. So they zoomed up again and flew around to approach the lake from the other side, over the mud flats. Well, this time they made it. It was a close scrape, but Ronald got them down. Well, there was reluctant Ronald sitting in the middle of the lake right in the heart of the desert, and the crew standing by on shore waiting for replacement parts to arrive. And that's where we'll leave Ronald for a while. I'll be back later to finish the story of Reluctant Ronald, so don't forget to listen. And now to our story. A violent storm has broken over the open rangeland of eastern California, turning mid-afternoon to night and lashing the parched ground with a torrential downpour. Hop and Tank, captured at gunpoint by Tex Regan and taken to a broken-down deserted shack situated in a narrow canyon miles from human habitation, suddenly find themselves in the greatest danger of their lives. For in the flickering blue-white glare of the almost continuous lightning flashes outside, they see a swirling tide of water rising on the floor around them. As he strains against his bonds, his face white with horror, Pop explains their danger to Tank, his words almost drowned out by the rolling roar of thunder overhead. This shack's in the middle of a dried-up riverbed tank. The storm's making the water pile up. Jump and change, then it'll be swept away. Yeah, if we're not drowned first, the water's already up to my knees. Oh, I'll try to get loose. Get to work on them ropes. I've been working on them, but it's no use. They're soaking wet. They won't give an inch. Oh, no, no, Hop. We'll drown like rats. That's what Tex Regan meant when he kept saying the weather was just exactly right. He knew this had happened. A dirty, rotten murderer. Hey, what's that? Uh, trees uprooted by the storm. They're floating down the river, crashing into the shack. Can't take much more of a pounding. When that wall caves in, it's curtains. There it goes! No! No, it's holding. The window's broken. Boy, a flying glass just missed my ear. Tank! Broken glass! Huh? Quick, try to get a piece. But what? Jumping Jenny's to cut the rope. Hurry up. Yeah, sure. Oh, it ain't no good hopping. It's all on the floor and I can't reach it. If I fell over, I'd drown. Yeah, there's still a few pieces in the window. Maybe I... Maybe I can get over there somehow. Ah, oh, watch yourself. Oh, that's... A little play and the ropes are on my feet. I think I can wriggle over. Please, Hop, you fool, you're a corner. That's our only chance. The window's still blowing. I'm sure I can reach it with my hands. There, I made it. You reached the sill? Uh, John, keep your fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, it's got a piece of glass. Watch it, don't cut yourself. I'm not going to worry about that at a time like this. Hey, maybe I can wiggle over, too. No, no, you stay put. Stretch all up too far. Oh, gosh, if only this joint will hold together till we get free. Uh, minutes, that's all we need. There, I one strand, it's, it's working. Keep back. Don't worry, I am. Brother, if we get out of here in one piece, what I won't do to that Regan rat, I'll tear him apart. So help me, I'll turn him inside out. There, there goes another strand. And I'll just one more. The water's up to my belt buckle, hot. We'll have to run like we've never run before when we get out. If we get out and if we can run. Hey, hey my hands are free. I'll have the rest of these ropes off and shake them. Come on, come on, don't hang on me now. Hop, the water's rising faster. I know, I know, relax. Relax? You kidding? It's up to my chest. Okay, I'm loose. Now, take care of you. My hands are underwater. It's going to be tough. Yeah, it'll be a cinch compared to what I just did. Hold still now. Hop, the wall's giving away. The corner's wiped out. Still, will you? We both can't make it. You go on. Save yourself. Yeah, you out of your mind. Please, Hop. You won't have a chance. When the wall goes, it'll come down and happen. Will you please shut up? I'm almost finished. Yeah. One more knot and you'll be clear. Clear? The water's up to my neck. Two shakes, I'll be flowing bubbles. Okay. How's that? 
my left hand's free, but the other one's still tied to the chair. Now well, work on the ropes around your waist. Check. Yeah. No. Tank is still holding. Okay. Thanks. Now if I can wriggle out of the rest of them. Don't get tangled up. There. There. Okay, I'm loose. Now, come on, find the double. We're going to have to swim for it. So what? At least we'll be out in the open. We'll have a better chance. Stand by now. I'm opening the door. Wow. Look at it. Four inch knife. Or we'll be trapped. Taking deep breaths, Hop and Tank braced themselves momentarily, then plunge headfirst into the roaring torrent. For a seemingly endless time, the boys plate through the swirling waters. Their breath burns in their lungs. Their chests ache with the strain. And then finally, they break through to the surface. Gasping for air and struggling to keep afloat, they manage to reach the safety of the bank. Ah, let me look at you. Huh? You ain't a ghost? Ah, not by a long shot. Oh, my gosh. How do we ever do it? Oh, don't ask me, pal. Lady Luck was really riding our shoulders that time. Well, you, you feel rested? Yeah. Well, then let's start making tracks. Where are we going? Back to Barstow. It's a long way, too. Well, what's the use of going back there? Well, first of all, our ship is at the field in Barstow. And what else? That's where we'll pick up the trail of Reek and Joe Bell again. Go on. There won't be any place within 50 miles of the town. Oh, it's done for good. Not if that $50,000 is still in the bank. It's our one chance of catching up to them again, Tank. When we do, we're going to pay them back for everything. Okay, pal. We go to Barstow. Rubbing his fists in anticipation, Tank strides through the mud and rain alongside Hop, both eager for the opportunity to strike back at their enemies. But if Tex Regan has already been paid the ransom money, they won't have a chance. Gang, you won't want to miss the climax of today's episode, so stand by. Now, gang, let's get on with the story of reluctant Ronald. You remember, we left Ronald, a Navy Catalina flying boat, on a lake in Arizona right in the very heart of the desert. The crew was standing around on the shore waiting for replacement parts to arrive. Well, that lake is in an out-of-the-way spot, and it took a long time for the parts to get there. And to make things worse, it was right in the middle of the dry season. Little by little, the water got lower and lower until finally there wasn't even enough left for a takeoff. Well, by this time, old Ronald was all fixed up, but he couldn't go anyplace. There wasn't anything to do but wait for the rainy season to fill the lake. The crew didn't like that very much, but Ronald seemed very happy about the whole thing. For four months, the Catalina flying boat stayed out in the desert. Well, Ronald must have liked that because he was ticketed for duty over the ocean. Maybe he didn't want to go. Well, months passed and the lake filled up again. And once more, Ronald continued his flight to Seattle. But that little vacation in the desert must have spoiled him because it wasn't long before he developed some more engine trouble. It was over the Salton Sea in California where the PBY-5 was forced down for the second time. This time, the crew was determined not to take any more nonsense. They got spare parts sent up from San Diego in a jiffy. And the next day, Ronald arrived in Seattle. Now he's fulfilling his Navy mission serving as a patrol plane over the Pacific. If you ever wanted proof that a plane had a mind of its own, here it is. It usually takes a few hours to fly from Philadelphia to Seattle, but it took reluctant Ronald more than four months. And say, fellas and girls, don't you be reluctant about planning a career in the air. This country needs pilots and technicians for the future. So get set to take your place in the air, and always remember America needs flyers. And now back to our story. It is late afternoon... The storm has broken, and only a few scattered clouds remain, now tinted golden in the rays of the slowly setting sun. We find Hop and Tank riding in a small, rickety pickup truck, having been lucky enough to get a lift out on the desert road. As the truck wheels into the outskirts of Barstow, Tank turns to the driver. Sure glad you came along when you did. We'd have had ourselves a long hike. You can say that again. Glad I was able to help. Hey, Hop, there's the bank. Oh, yeah. Want me to let you off there? No, no, we're going on further to the airfield. Oh, okay. Why, Dad, bless your heart. Hey, watch it. Hey, dudes racing around the big car and hogging the road. Thanks, that's Ivan Ivanov's car. Jumping Johnny, and he's stopping at the bank. Hey, uh, let us off here, will you, sir? I thought you wanted to go to the airfield. Well, we have to stop here first, please. Okay. Hold on. Oh. Hold on. 
Well, there you are. Uh, pile up, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the lift. Don't mention it. Uh, don't slam the door or she'll fall off. Okay. Come on, thank you. Hey, there's Ivanov getting out of the car. Oh, yeah. Oh, what? What are we doing uh, here? Big selfie, huh? buddy. Oh, roaring as usual. But he... Mr. Ivanov, you said you wanted to come here. Oh, but so where is everybody? What can we do standing on the street like some scum? Mr. Ivanov! Hey! Mr. Ivanov! Look, sir! Mr. Hannigan, Mr. Tinker! Boy, sure was lucky we spotted you. We almost missed you. Me? And what, may I ask, have you been doing? Oh, gosh, don't ask. Don't ask! That is exactly what I'm doing, Mr. Tinker. Uh, fine, how are you, this is? Everybody deserves Ivanov in his hour of need. Please, Mr. Ivanov, calm yourself. How can I calm myself with... Oh, oh, my ulcers, Mr. Peabody, the peppermint. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, Mr. Harrigan, you will please explain. That's what I've been trying to do, sir. So commence beginning. Well, we followed Dixie here to the Barstow Bank. Heard her making arrangements about the payment of the $50,000. So she is really giving that cow mangler Texas Regan money for the horse? That's right, sir. The only thing I'm worried about now is that Regan has already been here at the bank to collect. Now the joint's closed. It's after three. I just have to hope he didn't contact Dixie in time. But what about Dixie, darling? Why should she go away? What do you mean, go away? That is what she told me. When did you talk to her? I did not talk to her. Mr. Ivanov, you're not making sense. Nothing is making sense. Here, look at this, Mr. Harrigan. What, Hart? That's a note. By airmail it comes this afternoon. Airmail? Straight from the airplane. It dropped almost on Ivanov's head. Tank, listen. Please forgive me, Ivan. I hate to run out on you like this, but I must. There's been too much trouble, and I just have to get away. Don't try to find me, because you won't be able to. Signed, Dixie Davenport. Reaching the end of the strangely worded message, Hop's voice trails off, and bewilderment mirrored in his eyes. He stares at Tank, then at Ivan Ivanov. But both shrug their shoulders. What does this note mean? What is Dixie up to now? Gang, there's action and suspense in our next exciting episode, so don't fail to listen. Tune in and fly with Pop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Hop Harrigan is a transcribed, copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday, same time, same mutual station.